So one is that one question that we've had is shall Muslims open or start their own schools, institutions in Europe and thereby be in a better position to hold on to their Islamic values, beliefs and traditions in today's as we've got this European society? The answer is you do not control power. They control power. And as a consequence, even if you build your Islamic school, the law requires you to teach in your school that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. And if you do not teach it, they'll close down your school. Then what do you do? Who will you complain to? Me? <laughs> huh? So I, I don't think you can beat this system. On the contrary, I am convinced the ship is sinking. And none can stop the ship from sinking. Because in the Quran, Allah has said that he's going to punish. This is his punishment. And it's going to be the worst punishment ever. Su'ul azab. So what is happening here is divine punishment. And <laughs> the, the, you cannot change this divine punishment. This ship is sinking. So I would make hijrah. I'd take my children out. I'd take my wife out. But the ones who would refuse to go, once they come here, is the wife and children. They don't want to go. Papa, you can go. We're staying here. <laughs> Papa, you can go. We are staying here. When you hear that, you know you've been defeated. Too late now. One of the arguments that I hear quite a lot, and specifically when I speak with Jamaat al is they say if we all do hijrah, who's going to do the dawah? to the people. Uh, Islam is still relevant in Europe uh, and Great Britain. So if you were to all move out and you move away from the ship, then who will save the ship? Give the Tell Tablik Jamaat, I am doing Dawah. Tell Tablik Jamaat, I am doing Dawah. But I don't reside here. I always try not to spend more than three weeks. This is the first time I'm spending more than three weeks. So I come, I do dawah, and I leave. And my dawah is reaching more people than the tablik dawah because of the internet. So this argument is invalid. Yeah, this argument is valid. Yeah. I wouldn't live in this country, no? And I most certainly would not allow my children to grow up in this country, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Salaam alaikum. My name is Shazad. It's, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be in your company. Um, from a global standpoint, um, how do we send the influence of the, the Jalik system on education and thus core values in the developing world in the current geopolitical climate? I remember uh, Professor Dr. Ishtiaq Hussein Qureshi, eminent uh, Pakistani historian. <coughs> <coughs> he was the vice chancellor of Karachi University when I was a student. And uh, uh, students who studied at Karachi University uh, had a compulsory yeah. In your first year, you had a compulsory course in Islamic studies. But nobody wanted to attend it. It was very boring. <laughs> the teachers who used to come to teach it could not fire the imagination of the people there. And these were all university students who wanted knowledge. And then... Uh, uh, Dr. Ishtiaq Hussein Qureshi then called on uh, my teacher, Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari, for help. <laughs> and uh, the Maulana was one, just one in a million. You couldn't get more teachers like that. So he would go to the auditorium, 
not to the classroom. And in the auditorium, the students would be packed in the auditorium. And when he lectured on Islam in the auditorium, he was able to penetrate, he was able to command the respect of these young Pakistanis studying uh, at the university. How can we do that? Not just in the developing world, but elsewhere. I will argue tomorrow night that the house of knowledge in Islam today is defective. And that is the Darul Room and the graduates of the Darul Room. And I will argue, which my teacher also argued, that we, knew, we need a new model, a new model of Islamic scholarship and a new model of an institution to study Islam. He said this in the 1950s and 1960s, which is how much, 70, 80 years ago. That's when he said it. <coughs> and in the 1960s, he established the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Karachi. And I left Al-Azhar, yes, to go there to study with him. And I've always said this was the best decision I ever took in my life. In that institute, I had to study, you wouldn't believe this, the philosophy of history. Yeah. I had Dr. Burhan Ahmad Farooqi, a PhD in philosophy, an <coughs> eminent scholar. And he taught me the philosophy of history. I had to study as a student in this institute. I had to study the philosophy of science. And when I studied the Islamic, the philosophy of history, I had to know what is the Islamic philosophy of history? What is the Islamic philosophy of science? And he brought one of Pakistan's most eminent scientists, Professor Sayyid Sibti Nabi Nakwi. He didn't care. He didn't care. Two peanuts that this man was a Shia or this man is a Sunni. What he was concerned about is that the man had a scholarship to teach. And that's how they came in. Then he brought for me uh, Yusuf Salim Chishti, who is the foremost scholar in Iqbal studies. The, the heads and shoulders above all the rest. And Yusuf Salim Shishti came to teach me at this institute. So this was not your normal Darul Ulum. If this scholarship today is commanding respect, not just in Britain, but in other parts of the world, it's because of Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari. Uh, now he is gone. Allah has mercy on his soul. And I am one man one man doing this work and I have now expanded from his teachings to begin establish a new branch of knowledge Islamic eschatology mm -hmm. so what we need now is young men who would be fired up and I want to be part of this team I want to build this new world of knowledge <laughs> in the world of Islam recognizing that the Darul Um cannot do it cannot do it okay and uh, if we work for it, can we succeed? Inshallah. Shall I tell you what the Prophet said? He said, I, he said, my ummah is like the rain. I do not know which shower is better, the first or the last. <laughs> yes. So there is a world of Islamic scholarship that's coming. That will dazzle the world. Yes, does all the work. And we're working for that now. <coughs> it's indeed a great honor to sit in your presence and to hear you, uh, uh, your work, uh, work, work, work for us. Uh, also, I have to tell you that uh, you are being listened. Uh, I can tell you about in Karachi, in Pakistan. 
and uh, big scholars like uh, Oya Bhagwujan and Zahid Hafid, which are uh, more, uh, most uh, uh, related to current events, are listening to you. And uh, uh, we are uh, in the progress uh, of, uh, you know, uh, updating our education system. And you've seen uh, what we are doing in Pakistan. Um, we are, it's a work in progress. We've made our country uh, uh, for Islam. We have uh, uh, done a lot of uh, things for Islam, and uh, it's not a uh, you know it's, it's a work in progress. I completely understand your views that uh, uh, we still have not reached uh, where we have to reach. But uh, uh, we in Pakistan we believe that we will uh, raise this flag of Islam once again, and through your brilliant. Um, Teaching, uh, we'll do that, uh, and uh, uh, very happy that you will, uh, uh, you know, do uh, some uh, teaching here in the UK. And I'll take that back home. I, my family is very connected, and I take it back to uh, the people that I know all all the things that I learned from you. Thank you. So much. Don't invite me to Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> we have to do the work from here. So we've got question number five. Can you walk through from the back? Yeah. Uh, one one minute, please. Yeah, before um, I'm actually working in Britain for Pakistan. I cannot do this work in Pakistan. They will cut me down, but they can't cut me down here. So I am do I'm sending the message to Pakistan from Britain, and. Uh, the, the most important part of this message is the methodology for studying the Quran. It is when we use that methodology for studying the Quran that we recognize some of the mistakes that we are making. Let me share with you one mistake. The Quran does not guide us to approach the Bible with a sword. It does not guide us to approach the Hindu Vedas with a sword in your hand. And yet our ignorance is so profound that when a scholar comes with a sword in his hand to rip up the Bible and rip up the Vedas, we applaud him. What a great scholar he is. On the contrary, the Quran teaches us to approach the scriptures of other people with respect. And when you approach their scriptures, you look for what remnant of truth still remains in those scriptures, rather than looking for what you can criticize and condemn. And when you find a remnant of truth in their scriptures, you recognize it as truth. And if they are not following it, you take it to them and say to them, brother, this is the truth in your scripture that you have forgotten. I never grew up in a society which hated Hindus. It was foreign to me. I grew up with Hindus around me, and they were men of integrity, men of knowledge, men of character, yes, and I, I did not know until I went outside of Trinidad that a Muslim has so much hatred for Hinduism and he speaks such vile comments about Hindus and such nasty things about Hindus. And then when I try gently so to teach them to approach the Hindu scriptures with respect, yes, there are many things in the Hindu scriptures which are wrong. But if you can find something of truth, then why don't you go there first? And they, they jump on my back like a bunch of monkeys with daggers in their hands and they stabbing me from all directions. He's a lover of the Hindus. Just because, just because I condemn 
approaching the scripture with a sword in your hand. That's all. Show respect for the Hindu religion. And if you have to defer with them, you have to correct them. Allah says, do it with his wisdom. Do it in a graceful way, not with a boxing match. How can I? How can I reach the Pakistani people? If you allow yourselves to be brainwashed with hatred and enmity and venom in your heart for the Hindu religion. India today has the worst government it has ever had in its history. Those who murdered and assassinated Gandhi are the same ones who are now ruling the country. They are destroying the Hindu religion. And because I say this, they are destroying the Hindu. The Pakistani people are up in arms against me. Why should I say that? Strange. If the Mughals built a masjid at Babri, and the Hindus come to me and say, this is where our God Ram was born. I am not going to ask you for evidence Go to the court, prove it. No. Out of respect for your religious consciousness. It's only two and a half acres of land. That's all. Out of respect for your religious consciousness. I would renounce all claim to Babri. Two thousand people have already been killed and they're still fighting in the court. But this is not how our people were. Let me take you back to a page of history. The British were in India. The Muslims wanted them out. And the Muslims established the Khilafat movement. And it was led by men who knew Islam and who lived Islam. I don't have to mention the names for you. And they wanted that when the British leave, we will live as Muslims. The Hindus were led by a man who was a sincere Hindu, Gandhi. Nehru was not like that. He is a secular nationalist. But Gandhi is a real Hindu. And Gandhi said, but that's the same thing I want. I want the British out. And when the British leave, I want that the Hindus should live in accordance with Hinduism. Of course, the British don't want that. So Gandhi went to the Khilafat movement and he said to Maulana Abdul Bari, why don't we make an alliance, a Hindu-Muslim alliance? Maulana Abdul Bari and the Khilafat movement were very happy, yes. Gandhi said, I have one condition. Stop killing the cow. Maulana Abdul Bari said, deal, we stop killing the cow. That's the kind of Muslim we had. That's the kind of Muslim we had. The leader of the Khilafat movement agreed. We will stop killing the cow so that the Muslim Hindu alliance could be established. Today, they will jump on his back and murder him for saying we will stop killing the cow. This is the kind of jahiliya we have to deal with today. Yes. We pray that Allah might help us to get out of it. Mm. Um, I would like to know to what extent do you think the challenges that we are facing here as Muslims within the, within the education system will perhaps surely um, or slowly but surely will that be a worldwide problem within the education system? Oh yes, Dajjal is a worldwide phenomenon. Dajjal is a worldwide phenomenon. The only difference between this country and the rest of the world is that in this country you come and you say, this is heaven. This is heaven. And we don't want to go back to hell. And those out there are saying, we're living in hell. We wish you could come to heaven. This is the brainwashing <coughs> which has occurred around the world. And our Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, the Dajjal will come to two things. What are the two? Hmm? 
That's right, a river and the fire. The jar will come with two things, the river and the fire. And whosoever falls in his river will have his load of sins increased. And whosoever falls in his fire will have his load of sins decreased. In other words, the jar will take the road to heaven and make it look like the road to hell. And he take the road to hell and make it look like the road to heaven and deceive all of mankind and they're rushing down the road thinking it's the road to heaven when in fact it's the road to hell. So the only difference between this country and the rest is here they believe they're in heaven and over there they wish they could come to heaven. <laughs> so there's two questions from the crowd. Uh, the first one is if we have to make hijra to a different country, which, in which, which country's education system is the right one? For this gathering here, I would go back to Pakistan. Oh, yes. Uh, I don't know whether you can get real naan over here. <laughs> but when I go to Pakistan, even the roadside shops, the roadside shop with the earthen oven, and you eat that naan, you, you immediately become hung hungry. <laughs> That's naan. <laughs> okay? So I would go back to Pakistan. And I would strive to rebuild Pakistan to what the Khilafat movement wanted. The Khilafat movement was more faithful to Islam than the All India Muslim League. No one can challenge me on that at all. Don't bother to try. The Khilafat movement was more faithful to the model of Islam, the model of a state in Islam, than the All India Muslim League. Pakistan was born as a consequence, as a replica of Turkey, modern Republican state. But if Gandhi had not been assassinated, and if the rug had not been pulled out from below the Khilafat movement by Mustafa Kemal, and I'm sorry to have to say it, but also by Dr. Iqbal, and the Khilafat movement had, restored, had remained, Pakistan would have been born differently. But the big war is coming. And after the big war takes place, then you have a chance now. You now have a chance to return to the Khilafat movement and launch a struggle for the model of a state which is in the Quran. So I'll go back to Pakistan and I'll struggle for that. Yeah. So one more question and then we have another one from the crowd. Uh, in this modern world where men and women both work to make ends meet, what is the best solution for raising the children? How long should the mom stay with the children? Any tips or solutions when it's difficult to stay afloat financially in this day and age? Okay. Where both father and mother have to work because of poverty, because of poverty, then you have to live as a family. The different families have to come together, okay, like a village. So when mummy, when mummy has to be away from home, it's a sister or a cousin or grandma, so the whole family comes together. So the child will not have this impact upon him of neglect, negligence, no. This is how the village used to live in the past. The village would come together when a mother could not take care of a child. Uh, and that is not possible in a modern society. Everybody's at work. Everybody at work. Everybody busy. So you have to put the child in a daycare center. And when the child grows up, and you now are an old man and an old woman, guess what the child does with you? Huh? <laughs> Yes, the child pays you back for what you did to the child. The child will put you in a home for old people. And that's where you live. Because you neglected them when they were babies, so they neglect you when you're old people, yeah. as I shall not only teach you. I've been listening to you about four or five years. 
Uh, you memorize some of your lectures. You memorize some of my lectures. Wow, look at that. All the time on a taxi driver, eight hour shift or long job, they were on a okay. The question is this, right? Uh, mainly I talk to the imams in the mosque. And uh, when I say to them, right, look, this world is controlled by Judo Majus, Muslim world failed to make us understand the Quran. And they got angry, they closed their right eye and they look me with the left eye and they call me yes, the Buddha Maju. So many got angry, like one of the guys he was he's teaching the other imam. When I told him, right, look, uh, the imams and the scholars of Islam have failed. That's why the Muslim world is in this situation. The non-Muslim used our hadith, the black flags, and they used in Syria and all that. It's sport of imams which is not explaining us the real Quran and the Hadith Monte So uh, they gave me name, some they called me Judo Maju. Because I tell them right, like, this is the situation of the world. Why don't we give football instead of poking on the uh thirkas and all that? Maybe in our mosques they talk about this. Mm-hmm. Or this, that, this, that. So nobody is poking on the Jal or Judo Majid, but so when like person like me says to them, look, this world is controlled by Judo Majid, or the Jal is on the corner, we think, what are you talking about? So what we shall we do about these people, you know, especially these imams, like when you say to them you are failure, they got angry. Yeah, good question. I have changed I have developed a strategy. <laughs> And my strategy is, I, I'm sure, inshallah, inshallah, we'll be successful. Inshallah. My strategy is two-pronged. I'm going to devote primary attention to this subject and then to this subject. Only these two. And eschatology, I put it back. Let it stay for a while. <laughs> Number one, the Quran and the moon. Methodology for reciting the Quran they do not have an answer to me. They cannot answer me on this subject. The Quran and the moon, methodology for reciting the Quran, because they're reciting the Quran wrong, and I'm correcting them. And people who listen and who read my book will recognize this is correct. So you're on a winning battle here. They have to submit. Then comes the second attack. The Quran and the stars, methodology for study of the Quran. If I spend the remaining years of my life only with these two, only these two, my students will study, will teach the eschatology. But this is the battleground. If we win this battleground, we finish. We've done our job. If we win this battleground, methodology for reciting the Quran and methodology for study of the Quran. So my book is already at the back, Methodology for Study of the Quran. I just have to make a change in the title. That is the Quran and the stars. Okay? Methodology for Study of the Quran. And this book, I'm almost finished with it. The Quran and the Moon, which is uh, Juma. Uh, you listen to it in Leicester. Methodology for Recitation of the Quran. It's a beautiful subject. Oh, beautiful subject. And... Uh, as I'm writing this book, which is almost finished, I'm beginning to realize that the subject is much bigger than I thought it was. Because we're dealing with the system of time. The system of time. And that is where Dajjal is waging his biggest attack, the system of time. I used to think it was the feminist revolution. I used to think it was riba. But it is a system of time where he's waging his biggest attack of all. And we have to try to bring the hearts of the people back to beat normally. So you will no longer feel time moving faster and faster. When someone follows this methodology, and as it happened in my case, and you no longer perceive time moving faster and faster, the Darul has no answer. They cannot answer. Yes. So this is the new strategy. Uh, give me a little bit of time to finish this book. 
And then what I'm going to do is launch an appeal for funds uh, to print because I want it to go out free of charge. <coughs> I don't want people to have to buy this book. So about 10,000 to go out right away. Hmm? And uh, we print it probably in Pakistan where we can get the cheapest rate, but a good printing. And uh, have been shipped to London because we can't print in England. Once this book is here, I want it to go out to the people. Then we'll translate it to French. We'll translate it to Urdu. We'll translate it to Swahili and so on. And have it printed and distributed the same method in other countries as well. This is where you can help. <laughs> so, uh, yes? So, uh, we need to uh, sort of leave by quarter past nine to one, have one tiny question, and then we shall be led a bit. One tiny question, and I do apologize in advance. Uh, I'm sure, firstly, Ron Khan is a fan of yours, right? Uh, as, as the progeny of domesticated colonial subjects, which I think the majority of us are, we're witnessing a demise of core values in the UK and equally a level of resurgence with differences and Islamic egos at the fore. Right? <coughs> Contrary to communities in South Africa, Caribbean, where I happen to work quite extensively, how do we reconcile shaking hands with the devil and influencing diplomatic discourse from an Islamic perspective? Mm. Um. It seems to me as though you are, your question is directed to the way uh, British Muslims are responding yeah. to the uh, challenges which they're facing. Um, I am not resident in Britain, and I only come as a bird of passage. Uh, and so my, my, my perspective is global rather than local. Um, someone who is resident in Britain and who is a scholar of that caliber would be able to assess whether or not British Muslims are making an effort in the right direction to deal with the challenges which they're facing. My input was simply to tell you that from the Quran, from the Quran, I know the ship is sinking. From the Quran, I know that this is monkey town, monkey town. That's in the Quran, funky down. From the Quran, I know that this is divine punishment, divine retribution, which is unfolding before our eyes. Okay, and hence, long ago, I gave the, I gave the advice: make hijra, go back to Pakistan, and when you go back to Pakistan, use the knowledge that you got here while living in this civilization. To go back there and tell the people out there, this is not heaven. This is not heaven. This is hell and that is heaven out there. And try to rebuild Pakistan to be what it should have been if the Khilafat movement had succeeded. So I don't think I could offer an answer adequate for you. But someone else who lives in this country might be able to do better, a better job in answering your question. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك ربنا وتعاليك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وزفنا التباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وزفنا اجتنابه Allah kindly show us truth as truth and grant that we might recognize it as truth and follow it. <laughs> and kindly show us falsehood as falsehood and grant that we might recognize it as falsehood and reject it. Allahumma adina al ashiya akamahi. Allah kindly show us things as they are that we might not be, be deceived by what they appear to be. اللهم إني إنا نعوذ بك من عذاب القبر ومن عذاب النار ونعوذ بك من فتنة المحيا والممات ومن فتنة المسيح الدجال وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلق محمد وعلى آله وعلى أصحابه أجمعين بركاتك يا رب العالمين